This episode is brought to you by Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it is completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It takes just a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter on Friday morning. It's that simple. Go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights, our biweekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives just like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails, just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. You're listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hello, my name is Eddie Jordan. I'm co-founder of Audio Vibes. Uh, you may know me for my DJing name, Eddie Soul, uh, which I've been a DJ for many, many years. Uh, also, my film, my independent film, House of Soul, which I did um, back in 2020. And um, right now, I'm looking to change and inspire the world with Audio Vibes. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Jason Grant. I'm the founder and CEO of Audio Vibes. Um, you may know me from Audio Vibes. Um, you see me on a couple of panels and uh, things like that on, on audiovibes.com. Um, we're looking forward to building a, a great and amazing community of independent artists um, to get their music licensed in sync for some really cool projects. Eddie Jordan, Jason Grant, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. Anytime. This is going to be a very fun and different conversation. We have never had any guest on to talk about the role of music in film and television. We've never had anyone on to speak to sync licensing directly, only indirectly. And not only did we get guests on that could talk about that, but we got founders. We got people running the business. So I know we're going to get to the heart of, of, of this field, this industry. And um, I think a great place to start, especially for this audience, I don't want to be assumptive that everybody understands or knows what this is. Can we just start with maybe a brief explanation of what Audio Vibes is and what sync licensing is in general? Yeah, um, and I'll go ahead and take that. So, Audio Vibes basically is a, we're a boutique licensing house. Um, we basically pitch music to music supervisors, production companies with the goal of landing a placement um, where the, the music is synchronized with uh, visuals, right? Movie, video game, um, television show. Um, yeah. And so uh, we primarily focus on the independent up and coming artists. Um, there's a, you know, there's a place for the major artists, but we focus on the emerging and budding superstars. I wonder if you can expand a little bit on, on sync licensing as well, just the industry as a whole. Um, well, the industry as a whole, as, as 
you might know it's it's booming, it's buzzing. Um, you've taken, you know, with the example of, you know, Stranger Things that has been in the press um, quite a quite a bit as you know a placement that, you know, not jump started, but it kind of propelled a song that was dormant for many years, and it took it to a new place of of fame, right? right. And so, sync licensing now um, is like that new buzzword. It's um, it's another opportunity, it's another revenue stream for artists to monetize their creative um, and intellectual property, right? Um, yeah. In the past, it's been all about, all right, you know, let me get my music onto the DSPs and let me film videos, which is still, you know, the, the ultimate goal in performing. Um, but with COVID and, you know, with things shutting down, I feel like artists had to they had to iterate, right? They had to get back to, you know, other creative ways to monetize and filming content was one thing that they did. Um, and then licensing for television and film um, was something that was already happening, but it just gained more notoriety. And some of the bigger stars became more recognizable through the sync licensing or the sync placement that they received. Okay. And for, for, forgive me, what is, what is DSP? Um, so that's like your CD baby tune core. That's where you distribute your song to get it into like, you know, the, uh, Spotify's and Apple music and stuff like that. Got it. Got it. I'm sorry, Eddie, I stepped on you. What, what were you going to say? Oh yeah, no worries. I was just going to kind of expound on what Jason said too. Um, you know, you, um, just to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying about how, you know, now it's such a great platform. Um, you know, in the past it would almost be a, you know, artists wouldn't necessarily even want their stuff on like, uh, you know, commercials or, you know, they kind of, you know, it was kind of like corny or kind of like, you know, they didn't want to be in that realm. They wanted to, um, you know, let the art shine in another way. But now this is like what everybody wants. You know, they want to be on uh, Stranger Things or Insecure. They want their song to break that way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's like bigger than ever. And it's only going to continue to grow because of so many uh, different outlets mm -hmm. and content that's out here that just keeps coming from you know, all these different streaming services that pop up almost you know, every other month. What changed, do you think? Because you're right. When I grew up, there was a bit of, there was a degree of shame an artist had if they sold out and suddenly their song that meant so much to everybody was on a Ford truck commercial. And now you look at the M&A environment, and I put this in our most recent newsletter, everyone is either selling their entire, you know, their entire um, bank of music, uh, or they're selling partial access and licensing mm -hmm. to their catalog. What, what do you think changed? Um, I think the the deal structures with major labels and, and publishing companies have changed where artists are getting a little bit smarter. Mm -hmm. um, they're understanding where the power lies. And I feel like this generation is just making a lot more money through platforms like YouTube and TikTok. And um, I can get into like how Audio Vibes started out on the content creator side. Um, we were paying content creators up you know, $20,000 just to put some music into one of their 30 second videos. Right. Um, and so where they started feeling the control is now with my art, I feel like the deals had to change where it's not about, okay, I need these labels. I need this. I can make my money. I can go and put my song and license it in a commercial and get $50,000 where it will take me millions of streams just to get that money. You know, it's like 300 streams, I think, for a dollar or something crazy, depending on the platform. So I feel like what changed is that, you know, the payouts are different for some of these platforms. The, the deal structures are not attractive anymore. And licensing, depending on what it is, whether it's television or advertising, it just pays more in some cases. So um, and you're reaching a much broader audience. And now that everything is so centralized with social media, you know, you can post, hey, I just got this new placement on this TV show and you've hit a whole new, you know, echelon of art of, of like fan base. Um, it spreads. Right. It catches on and more right. artists want that. So I think I think it started just from, you know, deal structures changing. And so many artists are talking about going independent. And these are just aspects that they can do themselves. They don't really need a label for. Um, and the licensing pays pays a lot better. I think it's yeah. a great point. It, it dovetails with 
some of the things I've heard songwriters from the 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s sort of lament about, which is the shift that the industry took to go to streaming that kind of started with iTunes, where those labels sort of sold out to iTunes as a shield against Napster and other companies like that. Mm -hmm. The taxpayer always seems to be the artist on that. A songwriter could write a song and live off those royalties forever. Yep. And now that's yeah. just not the case. Uh, you mentioned 300 streams for $1, which is shameful in my opinion. I think we value art a lot more than that, but uh, business models may not, right? I think it's 3000 views on YouTube for $5. Mm -hmm. And the thing I love about sync licensing so much is that it is about artists figuring out a way to maintain their income, to maintain their revenue stream at the level or close to the level it used to be. And at least it being a little bit in their control and it dovetails with a concept that we've coined the fifth wave. And the fifth wave is a, is a time in the future where the affordability of complex technologies meets um, sort of uh, meets creators at a place where uh, and, and, and society at a place where those complex technologies start to take jobs. So if you have um, a robot that is complex, that is uh, proficient enough to do complex human interactions like serving coffee. Now we might think that's a really simple thing. We have machines now mm -hmm. where you put a cup under there and the coffee comes out automatically, but that's not really what a barista does, right? Like there's interaction right. Right. and there are robots that do it. There are robots yeah. that can fry French fries. Now there are robots yeah. that can paint fingernails. So all those jobs, when they go away, those people will need to create things just to pay their rent. They'll need to find their thousand true fans to coin Kevin Kelly's famous article, thousand true fans. And here you have sync licensing and your ability to easily sign up with like the audio vibes and, and say, Hey, I need, I need as many rev streams as possible. And I don't want to share my revenue with a YouTube or a Spotify because that technology becomes affordable enough for other people to write that code. It becomes so right. ubiquitous that like, I don't need to sign up for YouTube. I can actually just, I can actually just have my own YouTube on, right. you know, jasongrant.com. <laughs> and then my real fans will find me. And, and that's how I'll make my money. And I think Radiohead started that 15 years ago. So, okay. It was Radiohead. Yep. Yeah. Just come to our website. And if you like our stuff, Leave us whatever money you think this album is worth. And if you think it's worth nothing, then leave nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting place we're entering, but I think it's aligned with future work. Gig economy work is, is, is essentially what I'm saying there. Yeah. Uh, Eddie, we, we should probably go back. Thank you for the explanation, by the way, Jason, mm -hmm. but we should probably go back to the beginning and ask the obvious, which is, how did you and Jason meet? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a great story. Me and Jason actually met uh, when we were playing football at Rutgers. Um, mm. We were in college. Um, Jason, <laughs> probably shouldn't share this story, but this is like the first time oh, we please. ever interacted. <laughs> was uh, we So when we were freshmen, we first got to Rutgers. The first thing you had to do was come in, you know, say your name and basically go get a physical. So we got a physical. Mm -hmm. I hate needles. Don't tell anybody, but I hate needles. And I was like dizzy. I had to, we had to get blood work and I passed out. <laughs> and the first person I saw was Jason at that time. He had this fro and he was picking it out. And he saw me on the ground. He said, yo, bro, you okay? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about me. I'm fine, man. And then ever since then, man, we just <laughs> we just kind of clicked. And, you know, uh, you know <laughs> so we, we, you know, we we were great friends in college. Uh, we were roommates in college. Um, you know, our, our friendship developed um, over the years. And we've always been very like-minded. And, uh, you know, we would sit up 
you know, late night in college and just like debate on things and, and like, you know, try to <laughs> outdo each other and stuff. But it was always respectful and it was always more of a sort of like a meeting of the minds where we could try to like, you know, push each other. And we still do that to this day. Um, you know, like, you know, every day, you know, we talk and we interact and, you know, Jason's like the tech guy, which we'll get into more, like, you know, and I'm like the opposite of that. So he will like not let me uh, not complete a tech task. He will sit there and be like, OK, it's time for it's time for your lesson. No, we're going to figure this out, you know, and, uh, you know, and I, yeah. I, you know, I help him in that way as well. Um, you know, even leading up to this. So um, we've always had each other's backs. We've always uh, been very, very close. I always called him like, you know, we, we've done other businesses together, kind of growing together and always uh, sharing ideas. And we've always been on that same path. And um, it's great to see like, you know, what we're doing now. And, and I know we're how, where we're willing to go to as, as well. So that's great. And Jason, what was it about Eddie's body on the floor that made you <laughs> want to walk up to him and, and just check on him? Like, it's funny because I also have the same, you know, needle affliction, I'd say, you know, but I, I mask it a little bit better. So when I seen him, I was like, you know what? I, I know what he's going through. Um, so it was just the right place, right time. He happened to be there. And I was like, man, I, I feel you, brother. Like, are you OK? <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, it's it's just been up ever since. And it's funny, like me and Ed, have, I mean, we started businesses in college. Um, you know, as, as, as we got older, you know, it has a family and, you know, we kind of went our ways and did the adult thing. And now we're coming back and it's like that whole experience has culminated to, to what we're doing now. And it's like all of our experiences, um, have met to where, like you said, it's sort of like with tech, right? You have this, this, uh, you know, the, this technology that's so high priced and it's, you know, used for certain things and now gets democratized and it's like easy for, you know, normal use. It's like, we've had all of these experiences that we now can use for this particular moment and this, this venture that we're doing. And it's like, it's perfect, right? It's, um, it brought us here and like, we're super excited to be doing what we're doing now. Yeah. I, I latched on to the part, Eddie, where you talked about, Hey, we've done businesses together and we know what to expect of one another. It's really good to fail early. So you know where everyone's strengths and weaknesses are and you can iterate on the next idea sooner. And that's what it seems like is happening now is like you guys found an idea that's future proof where sometimes you create a business that's just for this moment. And then you realize three years on the line, damn, uh, we've yeah. been derped. Uh, <laughs> where, I, I, you might've told me this already. So forgive me. Uh, where, where did you guys grow up? I know you went to Rutgers together, but before that, where, where did you guys grow up? Yeah, Jason grew up in New York. He grew up in Queens. Um, I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, so yeah, so and we that's where we met. But yeah, I mean, I love what you said, man, because what you said is like literally me and Jason, we talk about that all the time. We talk about failing fast and failing early. And yeah. we always look back at what we did and we never look at it as failure. We always look at like all the the things we were able to do. Um with uh, like, you know, even when we originally started doing a certain business together, we just did it because we had an idea and um, we just we just said, listen, we're going to build this plane as we're flying it. That was like always our thing. And, um, you know, all that experience gave us, you know, all the knowledge we need to do now. And, um, you know, that's why we feel like, you know, this is when we, we told each other, like we were like, this is it. This work, we're making this work. We know that this is it. We know that everything that we did in the past has brought us here. Um, and we're able to acknowledge that and see like all the great things we've done. And, and we're seeing it right now, like every day that we work, it's, it's like so exciting to, to be doing it. It's, it's, yeah. we always talked about doing it with, uh, you know, with, with each other and, you know, whoever else was in our friend group um, right now, it's just me and Jason, but, um, you know, we always talked about that and coming up together, you know, so. Yeah. It, it makes it a lot more fun, a lot more powerful. It doesn't take you it doesn't take long for you to figure it out, especially once you have a close friend in your corner or let's say a family that you're building. You'll always in college. I would always get critiqued about, you know, my, my family and yours, or maybe someone would, would have advice for me about children. I'm like, you don't have any kids. <laughs> right. You can't talk to me about kids. Right. Yeah, I can. Well, you think just cause you have a kid. I, yes. Yes. <laughs> something changes yeah. you don't get to critique it you, you you don't have the perspective 
it takes uh, to to critique these things. And you know, the reason the reason I bring it up is is when you run a business and you create a thing from scratch, it's kind of like your baby. And a lot of people walk around and they feel very trapped by their circumstance. And one quote that sticks with me, or it may not even be a quote, it just might, it might've just been some like a conference, something that was said like a paragraph, but I'm going to condense it by Steve jobs. And, you know, he said this, I guess maybe 15 years ago, but it's, or maybe more 20 years ago, but he said, look around and he would tell, he was, I think he told his kids this, perhaps his kids, maybe his coworkers, but he would say, look around. Everything you see was made by somebody no smarter than you. Every single thing you see. And so once you embrace that and understand it, and you can do it with a friend as well, you have a flip of your mindset completely flips. Yep. Absolutely. Right? Like, like I don't have to accept the world isn't a thing that happens to me. The world is a place that with infinite abundance that I can create anything that I want in it. And the worst that can happen to me is that someone says no, or it just doesn't succeed in the way that I thought it would. Again, you know, stealing from you a little bit, Eddie, where it's like, yeah, we didn't fail. It just didn't iterate the way we thought it would iterate. So let's try again. And, and I'm, I'm better for it, not worse. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. I love that you guys you guys share that that mindset. I know that um, you're also Eddie Soul yeah. DJ, yeah. but how did you decide to be in this part of the industry, sort of the sync licensing part of the industry? Like, what? Um, I'm a musician. It's 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 something I say all the time. You can see the the studio behind me. You can see the pianos and all that stuff, the keyboards. It. Is it was it difficult to decide to to get on the business side of this and behind the curtain and not be out front the creator booking gigs selling music? I guess um, that's for you, Eddie. And then Jason, if you could follow Eddie with just how you decided to to dig deep into this side of the industry, the music industry. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's um that's a great question. You know, like you said, uh, you know, I've always been on the front side. Um, you know, being a DJ for so long, and then like I said, I did my independent film. Um, and I've always like loved watching movies, always been really into that. Always really been all my favorite directors, whether it be Quentin Tarantino or Spike Lee, um, uh, you know, Martin Scorsese, even, you know, they always had like these great soundtracks and I, you know, I always like had a, um, a ear for the music and I always thought it made the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. even when it came down to certain TV shows, um, I, I always thought, uh, I always like had an ear for that. And I always liked that. And I was always, um, you know, kind of curious, but never like really looked into it. Um, and then the second part to that was, you know, again, me and Jason, we, we were working. Um, so I was working on something and Jason, um, when he, like the first iteration of audio vibes, like you said, we, he was doing the content creators and we were working together doing that. Um, and then it switched and, you know, we, me and Jason started talking, Jason and I started talking and we said, this is how we're going to do it. And it made it so easy for me because again, like, this is my guy. Like, you know, this is, uh, right. and when he had that idea and when he, when he told me about it, I was like, we're in that's done, done deal. We're in. And <laughs> I was excited about it. And, uh, I was like, this just makes so much sense. This is what, this is, this is what makes sense for us. And, um, I guess that in, in just knowing that me and Jason and I, we've always, um, like we've always had this fond thing for creators and, and people who were able to make this music. And we always talked about our favorite producers, our favorite artists and, you know, what kind of work ethic it took for them. And, um, with that, we, we wanted to show this other side for, for artists and we wanted to help them in that way and educate them and teach them and get there. And like Jason said earlier, like, you know, really get their art out there in this way. Um, to, to help them in that way. That, that really is what drives us. That's why, um, you know, we heavily curate our roster and, um, you know, that's how we're starting out. And we, we stay very close with them and we, and we communicate with them very often. And we go see them live at, at their shows. I just saw one of our um, artists that will be joining us soon uh, over here in New York. Um, so, you know, we, we just love it, man. Like I, I get up every day. I love doing this. So that's really what it is. That's beautiful. And, Jason. and so, so for me, um, and I, I don't want to like age myself too much, but like Eddie said, it kind of started at Rutgers. Um, you know, I, I had my, my little time as a, as a producer. Um, I, I made, I made my beats. I've, I've scored independent films. Um, and 
my younger brother now is a producer. So being far removed from it and then seeing him go through it, it, it kind of like reminded me about all the things that I did and what I could have done, you know, working with artists and making music and, um, you know, being out there. And like, this was all like a way for me to pull everything together and say, okay, this is how it needs to be done. Right. Like had I have known this information or had I have, you know, had an opportunity to be with like an audio vibes or understand if somebody told me about sync licensing back then, I wouldn't have been so focused as a producer to land a big major placement, you know? So I think part of it was like, here's an opportunity to let up and coming producers and songwriters and, and artists know that, Hey, you don't have to go for the platinum hit, right? You don't have to hit it out of the park. There's other ways to monetize and have a really successful career in music and entertainment doing what you love. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's sort of like our positioning is like, um, you know, finding those undiscovered talents and giving them those opportunities to maybe just one placement will take them to that next level. But it doesn't have to come from, you know, aiming for a million streams on Spotify. Right. You can have, you know, a lot, you know, some of our artists have maybe 500 listeners on Spotify, but they have amazing music and one placement can take them here. Right. And that's what we want to see. What did you do before you started Audio Vibes, Jason? Um, so, you know, I went the corporate route. I, I worked in sales. Um, I had a business myself for about five years. I was on the marketing side. I, I worked with a lot of startup companies um, and I helped, you know, not only launch brick and mortars, but I handled the branding and marketing side for them. I did that for about five years. Um, so it kept me in touch with my entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, going in the corporate world also taught me the business side of things and, and, and how corporations work and business models and, and scaling and things like that. Um, and so, you know, taking all those experiences into my own ventures, it's like, okay, you know, now I understand how to build a team, build a business. You know, I know how to scale. I understand, you know, where to fill in the gaps where I don't have the skill set, how to, you know, hire and, 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 and find talent. So all that stuff came from, you know, my experiences working in corporate. And this is not in the music industry, by the way, like I worked, in, you know, in finance. And so, um, you know, but that inner musician and inner producer never left. And right. um, seeing my brother get into it, it's like my brother followed my exact footsteps, played college football. Now is making beats and DJing and stuff like that. So it's like, here's all the, here's an opportunity to kind of like, um, you know, give back what I, what I, what I didn't know. You know what I mean? here's my experiences and here's how I can, you know, help somebody else that, you know, I would have liked to have that mentor or somebody back when I was younger to know, Hey, you know, stick with it because there's other avenues to this. You know, yeah. you don't have to be the next just blaze or Kanye West. Like you can actually make a living scoring films and, and making music for, for, for advertisements. No one told me that. So when I see a lot of these artists, like my brother, especially is just like, Hey, I, I, I need to find an artist. I need to make them go platinum and I need to sell my beats for a hundred thousand dollars and be like the next, you know, Timberland. Yeah. It just doesn't have to be that way. There are other ways to make money in the game. And, you know, this is just how one way that we, that we know that you can make money. That's a great point. Uh, one of my buddies, Stacy Weidlitz, who wrote, she's like the wind for the movie Dirty Dancing. Oh, wow. Uh, he's been on scholarship ever since. Shout out to Stacey <laughs> Weidlitz for, <laughs> for writing uh, one of America's great songs in, in films. Uh, but he's scored films. He's, you know, he's that, that one song, you talked about this. This could be a lot of things. And for those not seeing it, we're, we're doing the whole uh, arrow straight up stock rising <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Um, we're miming that, but it's, it's, it's not just money. It's not just exposure. It could actually be that, oh, now let's hire this guy or gal. And that's mm -hmm. what happened to Stacy. Like once he wrote that song, it's like, well, come score my movie, come score my movie. And, he, and the rest is, is, is history. He's had an incredible uh, career. It's been very diverse. Uh, I want to, if it's okay with you, I want to get into a little, into the weeds a little bit. <laughs> if you'll, if you'll allow me. And I want to talk about these six types of music licenses. So there's sync license, which we, which we've brought up. Mm -hmm. but then there's mechanical license, master license, public performance license, print, right license, 
and theatrical license. Is there a type that you guys don't deal with or wouldn't deal with or, or is one superior, superior to the other? Um, Maybe go well, into this a little bit uh, and, and that could be for either you, Eddie or Jason. Yeah. So we deal, not to say that we would never, um, we're just not at the point where we have to deal with like theatrical licenses and things of that nature, depending on the project, but we focus mainly on the sync license. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just basically syncing the song with, you know, with film and, and television. It's tied to, you know, your performance rights. So like, for us, our biggest job when it comes to signing um, or, you know, working with an artist that signs up to our platform is making sure that the rights are clear. Mm -hmm. um, now, mechanical right, mechanical license, that's more so for like your, your recording, right? But we focus more so on, you know, like I said, the sync license, which is it, it deals with the master rights and the, and the publishing rights. So when we work with an artist, we need to make sure that we know the ownership of both sides. Um, now, how the artist gets paid is their performance rights, right? So that's your, when, it, when a song is synced um, and you get paid from your PRO when, this, when, when it airs or whatever, um, though, that's mainly the space that, that, that we play with and um, how we educate our artists is how to get your song even in the system to, to get paid. Right. Because yeah. most artists, they know, just let me release it. Let me put it on Spotify. Um, but there's more to it than that. So a right. lot of those we, we haven't dealt with some of those other licenses um, just for the nature of the projects that we're on. But I, I could imagine a music supervisor would have to deal with that more on a daily basis because they work with, you know, syncing for, you know, they might have to do a, a Broadway play. Um, they might have a scene in a movie where, you know, the artist is performing that song in the movie. So it becomes a sync and a perform. Like, so there's different, there's different That's ways. Yeah. 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 There's different ways that the song is used um, that you would have as a music supervisor, you would have to make sure all of those rights are cleared and, and paid for. Got it. Eddie, how is music licensing different for international or internationally produced content? And how do you guys deal with the difference in currencies, if at all? Yeah, that's a good question. It's actually, um, there, there are some slight differences in, in that. We haven't um, necessarily dealt with that just yet. Um, that's actually something we're looking into. So, you know, when we're back on the podcast next year, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it'll, yeah. Be, it'll be a little bit of a different conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we haven't done any international yet, but it, it does affect uh, the, the PROs uh, a little bit different over there. Um, they have uh, they don't they have BMI and ASCAP, but it's, it's different over there the way it works. But the, we've also been in talks with uh, not not in talks yet, but uh, we've had some ideas of working with um, some international um, sync agencies as well and doing some partnerships that way. Um, that's something we've also been looking into. But like I said, you know down the line that we'll, we'll be getting more into that. Yeah. But for now, like we have, um, we just had our first international artist sign up. He's, um, actually from Norway, if I, if I am correct. Um, so oh, that's cool. going to be interesting in licensing. So from, from our standpoint, it's really just cause we're dealing directly with the artists. Um, we are controlling the master and the publishing side for that artist for worldwide usage. So mm -hmm. if, if um, the music supervisor wants to place the song, um, you know, they've got clearance to use it um, worldwide. So as long as the PRO information is correct from the artist, um, the artist can get paid. And that's where it can get tricky when you have, you know, different performance rights societies that are collecting the monies, um, some money just sits on the table, right? It's not, it's not able to be collected, but part of what we really want to do is make sure that all of that is cleared so that the artist gets paid. The music supervisor has a one stop um, and everyone is happy, right? We don't want to work and say, all right, we got your song placed, but you know, you don't, you didn't get paid because the paperwork wasn't right. You know, and, and sometimes it could take a while for an artist to get paid especially if it's international. So we definitely want to make sure that the paperwork is right. And all of the metadata and the information is correct, especially international. That's why we want to, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Eddie. Go oh ahead. yeah, really quick. I just wanted to just kind of add to that, you know, just give a, 
it just shows like the the job that the music supervisors have to do, um, you know, and how expansive mm-hmm. that job is. Um, that's why, you know, like our thing is, you know, we want to do, you know, what they're doing on our side so it can be pre-cleared and everything. So by the time it gets to them, it makes their job a lot easier. That's like a whole purpose of us, right? Because, right. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, people who are limited, like most people don't know what super music supervisors do. And if they think they have an idea, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, they're just sitting back, picking music that sounds good for this scene and that. But, you know, that's only, that's like the smallest part. Like, you know what <laughs> I mean? All the rest is the really, the real work where they're like, you know, they're grinding and trying to, you know, they're going here and there, trying to clear this, trying to make sure this sample is good and uh, trying to make sure, you know, everybody's lined up as far as the publishing, the master side and everything, you know. So that's why uh, they prefer to come to people like us. Um, you know, because it's all pre clear. We know we've done the work for them. So when it gets to them, it makes it way, way easier for them. So I just want to like shout out to them and just the great job they do and the hard work that they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Jason, you use the acronym PRO. Is that Performance Right Organization or or, or is it? In- yeah, yeah. Performance Rights Organization, like your ASCAP or your your BMIs, um, that's over here in the state. And I believe CSAC is another one. Um, and then as you go internationally, there's a long list of them. And so having like a, a publishing administrator allows you to kind of like put your arms around all of those. So, so we've recommended um, song trust you with, for our artists that allows them to kind of one click upload to hundreds of societies so that if your music is ever placed, they do a good job in collecting um, those royalties. And I believe they take like a 10 or 15% um, commission off of that, but it's another way for artists to take control over their music and their career. They don't have to sign a publishing deal. They can have a publishing administrator that is doing that work for them. Yeah. All of this work. And to your point, Eddie, all all of this work is so important and Mm -hmm. it's a lot like being the postman. Like they always say postmen have the potential to have a psychotic break because the mail never stops. <laughs> right. Yeah, and man. I would say also the music never stops and the chasing of where that music is being played or stolen or whatever sampled, it never stops. So on one hand, you're always going to have work. On the mm-hmm. other hand, you never get that satisfying sense of accomplishment. Like you have in most industries where it's like, I reached a goal and now I can rest. Uh, right. so that takes, a, us, that takes a certain type of personality. And I think it's great. Yeah. It, it's crazy because like for us, like that's the job, you know, um, yeah. the, the placement comes when all of those other things are aligned. Um, so right now, you know, we're in the process of building the catalog and the, the, you know, the most, um, challenging and rewarding part of it is getting all of the information from the artists, yeah. right. Making sure that's organized. And so now we're like, you know, we have, a song that is ready to be pitched and licensed right now. So that that's the joy of it. Like, you know, the, 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 the journey is, you know, doing that and then getting the placement, right. That's obviously Mm -hmm. the reward, but you know, with the schedules of the music supervisors and where we are right now as a company, like we're doing a lot of the phone calls we're, we're picking up, we're, we're, we're selling the, the artists, we're, we're doing a lot of the, the groundwork to build the relationships so for us, it's like, you know, when we get a new artist that signs up to the platform, it might take them, you know, three weeks just to finish uploading a song because, you know, they don't really know what they, you know, what they don't know when it comes to, you know, sync licensing. And it's something that we have to teach them and, and educate them. And, you know, once they get that part down, it's like, okay, now they know going forward. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a workshop next week and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with artist managers. Like, if you want your song synced, like, these are the things that you have to work on, not only in the studio, but when you get out of the studio, right? Yeah. Cause it makes our job easier, which in turn is going to make the supervisor's job easier, which in turn is going to make them want to work with us more. And you're happy because you're getting more placements, right? Like Eddie said, they, they rather work with an agency that can do the vetting, right? Do the, right. some of the legwork to, to get, get all of that, um, you know, the questionable rights holders and all that stuff, wrangle all of that and say, here's a song that when you use it, you know, you're not going to get sued, you know, a month later, right? right. Somebody's going to come knocking on the door and saying, you didn't have rights to, to use my song. Um, you know, that's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. 
at scale, you guys are going to need a bunch of employees. So I can't wait to see that that happen because <laughs> yeah. you, you guys can afford to be spoke, on every single added, call. <laughs> yeah, we've added two other people since the last time we spoke that are helping with just that. Um, we have Absolutely. someone on acquisitions um, getting us, you know, the talent. And then we have somebody managing our accounts. So as yeah. new artists come in, um, they're the ones helping us to, you know, make sure that the music is is finished, right? You have all the information, um, you know, are you working on any new releases? So we always have like a revolving door of, of, of new fresh music that we can pitch. Yeah. It's really rewarding. We just finished a pitch competition. Well, well actually a creators conference. Sorry. We did do a pitch competition, which we normally do on a regular basis, but we read a creators conference and one of the guys there was a uh, sync licensor as well. And he had an artist that was, about to lose house and home and had been making great music, but just hadn't worked out for him, wife, kids. And he finally got a placement for him and it paid him 200 grand. And wow, he called the artist and they both were in, they both weeped on the wow. phone, just cried their eyes out. Wow. And it's, it's a really interesting business you guys are in where you get to make that phone call and it's super emotional for both you and for, yeah. the artist yeah. absolutely absolutely for sure. for sure absolutely and then that goes back to the point of like you know i don't know is he like a composer or is he an artist i'm not sure it seemed like he was an artist based on okay. the description we got at that conference because the sync licensor was the one speaking the artist wasn't in the room got it got it okay yeah. But, but like going back to, you know, where artists are today and what they think success is and the, the path that they take, I mean, 200 grand for a, a sync fee, you know, some artists are not even clearing that with, you know, tens of millions of streams, right. you know what I mean? Um, across platforms. And so when you're putting money out of your pocket to travel and, you know, book studio time and record, pay for production, shoot videos, all that stuff. And it's like, this is just another way for you to supplement, right? Mm-hmm. And you can put you can put your song into a catalog and not get a placement, but then 15, 20 years later, you know, you get a you know call from a music supervisor, hey, I want to put your song in the show called Stranger Things. And then, you know, boom, you know, a song that probably had minimal success in the 80s is now one of the number one songs on the charts. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for artists out there that are listening, um, you know, there's other ways to do this. You know what I mean? Don't be yeah, yeah. down if you, you know your streams are, are low. Like, start looking at other avenues, other you know sync agencies that can. If you make really good music and if you're like, hey, my stuff sounds like it can be on that show, then you know go for it because you know two hundred thousand. I mean, that's that's incredible. Life changing. Yeah, it's, it's 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 unreal. Jason, can you speak to consent just decrees and what what they are and why they're needed? Say that one more time. Consent dec- uh, decrees. It from from what standpoint? From the the standpoint of the the artist. Yeah, I think so. So it's 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 about um, copyright royalty judges or or sort of the the Songwriter Equity Act of 2015. Maybe it came out of there. Consent dec- decrees. Uh, D e c r e e s. So I decree this to you. I decree your consent. Well, in terms, the, the, I mean, I'm not familiar with that term, but what I can imagine if it's like signing over your rights, is that what you're getting at? Like, yeah, if you're I working, think they're needed. Let's see if I have it. Um, yeah. So, um, why do the consent decrees exist in the first place? What do the consent decrees do? Let's see. So it's like, it's uh, the benefits of antitrust provisions for, for songwriters and benefits of antitrust provisions for independent publishers. Yeah, see, from the publishing standpoint, we, we don't really get into that because as, as an agency, like we don't, we're not publishers, right? So Got it. we don't take any of the artists publishing. Um, we're, just, we're just the sync agents, right? So our platform is basically connecting artists with opportunities. Um, but when it comes to publishing, we 
we would encourage the artists to be self-published, but if they are working with the publisher, you know, we would have to work with that publishing um, entity or that company to clear the rights. But for the most part, if you're an independent artist and you're self-published, you control everything. So you don't, you don't actually have to have any uh, ownership in the, in the work at all to, to do this work. Not at all. Artist doesn't lose anything. No. And in fact, okay. it's a, it's an advantage working with us because a lot of um, artists that we work with, you know, they've been signed to music libraries. They've had publishing deals. Some of them have even had record deals um, and they're now independent. And it's going back to like, like you said, like these technologies are democratizing, you know, the artists and their business, right. To where I don't need a record label, yeah. right. My, my buddy can shoot my videos for me or I could do it on my phone. Right. Yeah. So these are, which speaking of phone, let me plug in my phone before it dies. Um, but these are things now that the artists have in their back, their back pockets and sync licensing is just another one of those things that the artist now has in their back pocket, right? They don't need, um, they don't need a label. They don't need a publisher. They can come to a sync agency. They can distribute their music themselves. Got it. I, I love that. So yeah, wrapping my head around it, it's, it's perfect for, it's like I said, it's, it's future proof. Eddie, is there yeah. money in you curating royalty free music? Basically you're doing the work for a buyer. Like, like they don't have to go out and try to find royalty free music. You've consolidated them, aggregated them and put them into different categories. Is there any money in that for you guys? Um, it's more, it's more vol volume based because like Jason said, you know, as a seek agency, we take our sync fee. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're not really looking at it as far as the, the money right now. Um, we're, we're, we're just looking to, to push out the, to push it out, um, to get it as many places as possible. Um, whether it be film, whether it be, uh, TV ads, video games, and with, with each one, there could be different deals, you know, um, certain, um, we could be getting paid differently, um, down the line if we do decide to go into some type of publishing. Um, but, but mostly we're, we're just taking the, the fee, the sync fee for right now. Right. Yeah. Let me rephrase the question. Cause that, that wasn't the, I, I can understand why, why your answer went down that path, I guess, um, not specifically what money, uh, you guys make or like what you're, we, we can get into that later. I guess what I'm saying is, is royalty free music. See, it's, it's basically, you know, common use music that anybody can find and use and put in their TV show, movie, right. Whatever. Mm -hmm. But is there value for someone like you guys to create a curated library so that that music is easier to find? And can you take a fee for that? So, right, so right, 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 yep. yeah, royalty free, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. So royalty free, um, it's something that I dealt with when I was, you know, in, in the version one of audio Vibes, and we were working with the content creators and we do a lot of, um, like YouTube stuff and, yeah. um, royalty free was a word that you throw around there. It doesn't mean that it's copyright free. Royalty free just means that you're not the one paying the royalty, right? Someone else is paid, like the artist, the creator still needs to get paid. Oh, but, got it. Okay. But, the, you know, because they own the copyright. Right. So it's like you can you can lease it from them. You can go ahead and use it and it's royalty free. And there's different pricing models that say, hey, come to our website, pay a subscription. Um, and we're, we've already paid the, the creators, the producers. We've already paid them a fee, which allows them to, in turn, um, license the music to you as, say, a, a filmmaker, right? You you want to put a, a song for a wedding video that you shot or a documentary, and you go to this website and you're like, all right, I'm going to pay a hundred bucks for this license and it's royalty free. You don't have to pay the, you don't have to pay the artist because they already did that platform already did. Oh, got it. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. now you can, you can go ahead and put that video on YouTube, do whatever you want. Um, because they're going to white label your channel so that you don't have to get the copyright strike. Got right. It. And so you can now use that music royalty free and I'm doing air quotes, right. But, um, the copyright holder gets compensated for that. And I think right now there's like, a you know, there's, there's two sides right now where the content creators and the music creators are trying to find that balance of 
uh, you know, um, perceived value, right? It's like, hey, I'm an artist. I make music and I want to get exposure. You have a channel and you get, you know, tons of views. You know, you need music for your for your stuff, right? Because right, putting right. out something without a music is is dry, right? It's just part of the the experience. Um, and so you say, hey, all right, um, you know, I can use your song and you can, you know, not give me a strike so I can monetize my channel. But at the same time, I'll credit you in the in the bottom of my description and my 700,000 subscribers will know that you did the music and I might even link back to your page. So right. that's like an, an even exchange, but now artists are, you know, and I'm, I'm pro artists, right. Cause coming back, you know, from my experiences and wanting to make money as a producer, you know, I'm for the side of the producer and the, the creator of the music because, you know, they have their expenses to keep up their studio. They got family stuff like that. And selling music is the only way that they really can eat. Right. In terms yeah. of, you know, different things. And so I feel like, you know, from licensing to content creators, there should be like a fair split of, Hey, I'll pay you for this, but you know, I get to keep all of the back end um, royalties that YouTube's going to pay me now, but what is that going to cost? Right? right. And so there's this, I don't need to pay for music thing, which is what, you know, supervisors are also going through that now, which is why they're unionizing because right. the industry is changing and the music is always left to the end. Right. The budgets are always pulled from the music department and they're doing all of this work and they're not considered part of the team. Right. They, they don't get compensated the same way. Um, so there's this this struggle going on with with the music side and, and the business side where we try to make it fair. Right. So the artists get compensated, meaning the, you know, the creators of the music get compensated and it's a value add to the, the music buyer. Right. You get a really good sound. It's not something that's stock sounding. Um, it's made from a real person that's actually touring and making, you know, a living off of this. Um, those people tend to benefit more from these opportunities than, you know, people are just cranking out music for libraries. Like we're not considered a library, so to speak. Right. We don't just have thousands of songs in our repertoire that, hey, we don't care. Right. We're actually talking to these artists. We're understanding their their marketing strategies, their rollout strategies, and we're promoting them to these supervisors who also like minded that, hey, I feel like this placement could really help this artist. Right. And they they want to do that. Right. They look at themselves as the new A&R as well. So yeah. if we can put an artist in a position to you know make money doing what they love and be involved in some really cool projects. then that's what it's all about. Yeah. Right. And, and the royalty free thing, it's kind of like. Hey, I just want royalty free music, which means in other words, like I don't want to pay for it. You know what I mean? I want royalty free, but someone has to pay for it. Right. The copyright um, owner gets paid or should get paid. Yeah, that's a great, great point. I want to take you guys through. It's not necessarily a rapid fire round of questions, but we, they are a bit close ended. So feel free to just answer them close ended if you want to, or yeah. expound upon it. Uh, so if that's okay with you guys, I'm going to, I'm going to start with, uh, exclusivity or non-exclusivity when it comes to like, which is better? What are the pros and cons of that? If I'm the artist and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm finding, I'm trying to discover which sync licensing company to go with. Should I find one that has, uh, that holds my music or, or keeps me exclusive or one that's not exclusive with my, with my music? There's pros and cons to both. Um, it's, okay. it's so exclusivity means that they are exclusive to that catalog. Um, more experienced sync license agents tend to want the exclusivity, they, they don't want anyone else pitching. Um, it also means that they know that they can get your music placed. Mm -hmm. um, it also means that they may want more for that, right, as a sync fee. Um, it just keeps, a, you know, a lot of hands out of the pot, right? So yeah. a non-exclusive deal, it's flexible. You can work with multiple people, but it can get messy when it comes to price points, right? If mm -hmm. you and I are pitching the same song to the same person and your fee is 10,000, my fee is 2000, then I'm going to go as a music supervisor or the licensor, you know, I'm going to go the cheap way. And then now 
it, it kind of just makes things, who do I have to get permission? So non-exclusive um, has its pros and cons. You usually, again, exclusive, they're going to want your publishing and all this other things. They're, they're going to want more from you, right? Because you're giving them exclusive rights. Non-exclusive, they tend to just want the sync fee. You keep everything else on the back end. Um, we're a hybrid. We're a non-exclusive. We're only exclusive to the songs. So mm. if you submit a song to us, we just ask that, you know, you don't have 20 other people pitching it because the community of music supervisors is smaller than the amount of artists and people that want their music placed. So the chances of, you know, pitching to the same person um, is greater, right? So we would ask that, you know, if you're working with multiple people, let us know and only give us stuff that we can pitch. So we don't look crazy. Um, uh, got it. Yeah. So I think that would be the, the, the pros and cons there. Eddie, again, this is me coming to you as an artist looking to figure out where I want to place my work. Would you say 35% for exclusive is fair, low, or high? And would you say 60% for non-exclusive is fair, close or fair, low or high in terms of what I get, my percentage. 60, uh, you're saying the, the artist is getting 60%. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, um, for a non-exclusive, it's always, you know, if you're speaking from an artist side, if you're the artist side, you always want to have some type of flexibility. Like Jason said, there's, there's pros and cons on, on, on both sides. If you're an artist, a lot of artists like the, the flexibility. Um, and, uh, 60%, would be a little bit on the low side, I would say. What about 35% for exclusive? What do you think, Jason? Um, the artist getting 35%? Yeah, for exclusive. Well, is that's that low, gonna, is that low, high, or low, right on target? That's really, that's really low. I feel like if you're exclusive and you can't work with anybody else, you're putting a lot of faith into that catalog right into that that library or agency um and again i'm pro artist right so i feel like the artists should get more um yeah. and if you're going to do 35 percent, then you're not giving up any publishing right or if you're only getting 35 percent, you're not giving up your publishing on the back end where most people are going to just do a 50 50 okay. sync and publishing um and that's sort of like the standard once you start getting lower than that it's like Whoa, you know, 60% is that's somewhat it's fair, right? Depending on where you go. Yeah, but like, right. yeah, but like, I mean, we're 80 20, right? And yeah. and we're non exclusive. So um it's more attractive to say, well, I keep more of the pie. Um, it's gonna make us work harder. And, you know, again, we find other ways to monetize and, and scale our business, but the artist needs to be empowered to keep their ownership. Very good. Um, that's very helpful. Large library or small library? What are the pros and cons? I'm I'm an artist again, and Jason, this is for you. What is it better for um, me to go with a sync company that has a large library where maybe well, a lot of artists are going to them, or is it better for me to have a small library so that you're more likely depends. to pitch my stuff? It depends because if you're like generalize like then you know you can just get lost in in you know 50 other artists that sound like you mm -hmm. if the library doesn't focus on something right you know a lot of these libraries have hundreds of thousands of songs in their in their repertoire so are they giving you service with that are you know are they you know are they specifically focused on you are you a priority for them um so those are some of the the drawbacks of going with the larger libraries that yeah they might have the accolades um, but you're just another artist and we've actually signed, um, artists that have come from bigger libraries, you know, that said they just didn't like the experience. They didn't like the business model. They didn't like the splits. Um, they like the fact that they can call me up on the phone and say, Hey, I'm working on this. They like being able to text us. We're accessible because we are boutique, right? We're smaller. So there's more attention and we are, we're hyper-focused on a, a particular, like, a few genres, right? We, you, you're not going to come to us if you want seventies, you know, Japanese style hip hop or, you know, eighties, <laughs> you know, you're not going to come to write us. write that genre down real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like it, it is funny because like we I, I hear supervisors and some of the requests it's like we're never gonna have that I, I mean I shouldn't say never but right now like we focus on what we are good at yeah. and that's another benefit to smaller niche libraries or again we're not a library but catalog managers is that um they're going to come to us because they know this is what we specialize in so we're probably going to be really good at what we specialize in as opposed to being okay at a lot of things it's like i i, I really like and we th- we think about this all the time too is like how do we scale the catalog and still keep that level of service and we have to like for every you know 100 or so artists that we bring on the platform you know, that's a new account manager, right? So you get that same attention and that same focus, you know, we're going to pull up to your shows when you're in town. You know what I mean? Like we want to be able to to grow and keep that integrity. And I think that's what makes a smaller library um, more valuable, I think more attractive to some someone that's independent. Because even, in, even in that, you know, you almost start to compete with yourself. Like, you know, let's let's say if you have a certain <laughs> amount of reggae artists, it's like, yeah. mm-hmm. how many more reggae artists are we going to take on? Because now, you know what I mean? When, they, when they're looking at the catalog, it's like we're pitching, you know, this many reggae artists, and now we have more coming in. It's like now they're, they're kind of going against each other, too. So you also have to look at that. Start to cannibalize yeah. yourself. Right, exactly, right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. All right, Eddie. So I'm an artist, and I'm trying to choose between a one-size-fits-all model or you know, a distinct sort of model uh, that, that um, is our tailored model. Who do mm-hmm. I go with? Do I go with the one size fits all model sync company or do I go with the tailored sync company? I would say you go with the tailored sync company. Um, you know, again, it's like, uh, you know, we, we want to develop the relationship, whether it's us or who, whatever sync company, you know, you want to, you know, I, I feel like it's better if you develop the relationship, you know, what their, what their strengths are, what they, you know, what they, uh, you know, their genre, you, you, you know, them, you know, um, you know, and the more, you know, them, the better you could pitch them. Right. Um, and, and that's what we want. You know, um, it's almost like, you know, if you ever watch like Jerry Maguire, right. Yeah. It's like, you know, the whole thing is like, he wrote that whole thing about, you know, do we want to be this big mega ed- agency and just have all these people on our roster and just like, kind of like, you know, focus more on that. Or then like, you know, personalized relationships with the people and really like, you know, tailoring to, to them, you know, that's, that's really, um, if, if I'm an artist, that's what I'm looking for. I, I believe, you know, cause even like, uh, you know, even though, you know, you sign certain things and, you know, we, we have certain rights to do certain things, you know, there, there may be artists that, you know, they get placed somewhere and they, they might not necessarily want to, to be in that. Like, you know, they, they might, you know, let's, let's say, uh, they have certain religious values and they get placed in a show that doesn't necessarily align with that. You know, they, they might not, you know, they might not want that, um, necessarily when, you know, if you're part of just some big conglomerate and they just like fishing your music out to the first come first serve, you know, they might not even have a say in that. So I, right. I would definitely say the Taylor side. I'd say the same thing happens in film. When you get a, a deal with certain distributors, they'll bundle your film with a bunch of other films and they'll sell all those films to a distributor as one package. Well, if you're the lead film, like you're the reason that the thing sold, you don't want to split that 50 other ways and you might not be cool with where you were distributed to. So right. I, I agree with that. Uh, Jason, what's the best piece of advice you've received so far in your career? And who did it come from? Man, um, now you got me going back into my the recesses of my brain. Um, and, and, and again, there's so many, but I feel like um, from where we are now, what I can say, it, ironically, it comes back from, you know, the days of, of, of playing ball at Rutgers um, is my head coach saying, you know, when you get there, act like you've been there before. Mm-hmm. So with, with everything that we're doing and all the stuff that we've been through, it's like we're working towards something and we want to maintain a certain level of professionalism and integrity and honesty when we get there so that it's sustainable, right? We want to be successful. Um, we don't want to act like this is something that, you know, we've never obtained. You know, we've each in our own individual careers have had, you know, a certain level of success and I feel like when you get to a certain point, um, you can lose focus when you when you taste that level of success. And so helping us scale and get better and making sure that we're we're able to bring on and retain talent is saying that look, when we when we get this, like 
we're still the same guys, right? Whether we have 50 artists or we have 500 artists, like we're, we're the same people, we're the same company, we, we keep that integrity. And I think that's been something always in the back of my mind as we scale. It's like, don't fumble this bag because you didn't know how to acquire it, right? So it's like, once you get there, make sure that you acquire the skills, the mentorship and the knowledge and so that you can stay there, right? We don't just want to be on top. We want to stay on top. What was, uh, what is your coach's name or what was your coach's name? Uh, that would be Greg Shiano. Greg Shiano, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Greg Shiano, head know, coach know, of that, football. Know that name well. Eddie, what about you? Best piece of advice you've received in your career and who did it come from? Yeah, um, you know, for me, it's uh, constantly learn. Um, <clears throat> I'm like, I love to learn. Um, I learn from everybody who I come across. Um, you know, even in our first interaction when we, when we first um, started talking, man, like I've learned a lot from, from you and Nick. Um, obviously learned a lot from my partner. Um, I would say that and also um, uh, never, never stop, man. Like, you know, like, so... All, all the I study like all these successful people, and one of the most consistent things is they're saying is like just don't stop. It doesn't matter about the talent. Like I remember like watching this this thing. I used to watch this YouTube video from Will Smith, uh, yeah. like, and it was called Will Smith Words of Wisdom. I used to watch that every morning. Like that was like my meditation. And in that, he was talking about. He was like, man, let me tell you something. Like, you know, I might not be more talented than you. You know, um, you might have this over me. Or whatever, but he's like, if we get on a treadmill, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's really gonna be two outcomes. Either you're gonna stop, like we're gonna keep going, like right, and you're either gonna stop or I'm gonna and I'm gonna beat you, or I'm gonna I'm gonna die on the treadmill. Like, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you're not gonna outwork me basically, like you know what I mean? So he's he was saying, like, you know, uh if 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 I don't beat you, I'm gonna be dead because I'm not gonna stop. I'm just gonna keep going, <laughs> you know. And yeah. and I think that's like the biggest thing in anything you do. You find so many times, like you know, people are onto something or they start something and they run into a little bit of struggle and they stop. Um, you know, when they, you know, the, the thing that they really want to get is right there. If they just kept going, if they just kept like pushing through, those are the people who always end up on top. Is the people who just, they just don't stop, man. It's like, no matter what happens, they just keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, you know, kind of like what we spoke about earlier, me and Jason, um, that's how we look at this. We look at like, um, all the things, uh, everything that we've come from, from the beginning to now, it's just us not stopping. You know, we could have easily, each of, each one of us could have easily just, you know, went our, you know, went on our way and just kind of like, you know, uh, did minor things and just been, you know, moderately successful with that easily, you know, but we've always had this, uh, this grander plan and this, this bigger vision. And we just wouldn't, you know, it's just something in each of us that we just couldn't stop. Like we just would not stop and see where we are now. So both of those pieces of advice are incredibly powerful and a couple of things stick out. I think the Kobe Bryant documentary, which I think you can still watch on Showtime, Mm -hmm. very powerful motivator. If you're looking for motivation as an entrepreneur, I think it translates very well from his sort of, you know, athletic motivation to your entrepreneurial, anyone's entrepreneurial motivation uh, for sure. And then the other thing specifically to, to both piece of advice is what goes hand in hand with that is self-love. And I've met so many creatives that don't keep going. They, they uh, can't act like they've been there before. They uh, don't have you know, that stick to that Will Smith talked about that you described, Eddie, because they have a, a, a self-destructive nature where the closer they get to the thing that they want, the more and more they tell themselves they don't deserve it. Right. But then their mm-hmm. actions go out in the world and they find ways to, you know, self-sabotage. Have it, have it, yeah, self-sabotage. Yeah, self-sabotage. Fall apart. Yeah. yeah. So really powerful stuff. And I think this also you know, full disclosure, this interview happening in, in the month of, uh, I guess, national mental health month. It's important to to love yourself enough not to self-sabotage. Now I say that because it's a bit of a setup. <laughs> you guys are so close. I can ask you this question without creating any beef whatsoever. <sighs> okay. I'll start with you, Eddie. What's Jason's biggest strength and Jason's biggest weakness. And then Jason, <laughs> you take it, take it the other side of that. Jason's biggest strength is that (laughs) 
he will lay it on me now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me. All right, okay, so let me start with his biggest weakness. His biggest weakness, and I wouldn't even say it's a weakness. <laughs> you know, uh, Jason will like you could tell him something, and he'll like uh, I don't want to say he'll argue with you. But you have to like almost prove it to him to see if it's right. Trust like, but verify. You know. So he's a yeah, he's yeah, a real yeah. It has to be verified, right, right. <laughs> or he'll have a better way. Like you know, yeah. like, like what do we do? You know, we'll do this. And he's like, huh? You know, I wonder if that'll work, or I wonder if this. Like you know, you know, that's Jason, and it's not a weakness. That's just his little thing. But mm-hmm. his biggest strength is that um, man. He will he will figure it out. Like that man will figure out something. You can give him any task. You can give him something he will never, like, he's never done before. He'll figure it out. Like, and <laughs> this is weird because I'm just thinking about this as I'm telling the stories. Like, we used to play, like, going back to college, we used to play John Madden football every day, all the time. Like, and I would beat this man all the time, but he would wow. never get, like, wow. mad. He would never, like, you know, stop and quit the game. He would sit there and try to figure it out, like, figure out a way. Like, but, and he's still like that now. Like, if you give him a task or if, you, if something's there, he will not stop. That's why I was saying earlier, like, he won't let me stop either. Like he won't, yeah, yeah, yeah. He won't <laughs> let me because he'll be like, no, we're going to figure this out. We're going to sit here. We're going to figure it out. And that's what he does, man. I mean, he taught himself how to code and, um, you know, he's just so he's self-taught in so many different things, man. It's, it's great to see, like, you know, you know, not to age myself again, but to see him go from like this young, this young, almost like a boy. I mean, I, I met him when he was eight, 17, 18 years old. And now this man, he, he will not like, uh, he, he will figure whatever it is out. I, I will say that about him. Like, you're, nothing you're a good man, out. Jason, for, for staying cool on Madden. I, I had some petty college roommates. <laughs> and, you know, everybody that's played Madden know, knows about the, the save, you know, the save feature on Madden that, that right. records your record. Right, right. And, <laughs> and I had yeah. a roommate in particular that when he knew he was going to lose the game for sure, he would run up and, and turn the game off. <laughs> and, and so the only thing I could do was either I'm either going to fight him Right. Or like let it go, but basically <laughs> he wouldn't allow it to be saved on my profile that I beat them X number of times. Right, right, right. Because he right, turned right. the game off before it saved. Right, and I that I took that W. Super petty. <laughs> petty. Super petty. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this much though: I feel like we've I've broken a lot of controllers <laughs> <laughs> playing, with Eddie, playing with Madden. I've I've had to buy a lot of PlayStation controllers. I say that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I once turned to my wife and I said, uh, "Hey, honey, I've been in all these Madden tournaments, and this is just like at the dawn of online too." I said, yeah. "I have never lost a game." Yeah, I've not lost an online game. I've not lost in a tournament. I'd lost, but not in a tournament, and like a tournament, physical right, tournament right. where I'm where people are. And I said, "Listen, honey, I think I just want to play Madden for a living." Right? <laughs> she stared at me for five seconds, turned around, left the room. <laughs> wow! I said, "I said, oh man, I think I made a, I think I made a bad move." I oh, I, like, this at the beginning of our marriage too. Like, I think right, I made right. a bad. She's like, who are you? Who, who, have I like, who did I just marry? Oh, man. <laughs> Crushed my dreams. That's what she did. But now, I mean, look at it now. I mean, there's people making, before I would say hundreds of thousands. Now these guys, these kids are making millions no. doing that. Shoot. Again, ahead of my time, bro. Right. Like, seriously, <laughs> like, come yeah. on. Come on. I was, yeah. I was there, <laughs> and I chose... To right. stay married instead. Chose love. Yeah, chose love. <laughs> yeah. Jason, what about, what about Eddie? What's his biggest strengths and weaknesses? Um, I'd say with Ed, um, his biggest strength, and which is why we've we've been close um, for so many years, and why we've you know done business together, is because he shares in that same you know whatever it is that we come up with, whatever hair brain scheme or idea that we think about, like he'll he'll get it done. You know, like we could start something tomorrow if we wanted to. You know, start a you know, a leather boot making company, like, and make, you know, Texas heel boots with the pointy, you know, like if we want to do that tomorrow, um, he would be able to like, he would either a know somebody in the business, (laughs) have some way to get connected to it. And it just makes it so easy to like start something and know that, you know, your partner is there and it's like truly this like yin and yang, like we might have different strategies on doing things, but it's like, all we got to do is throw the idea out there and it'll come to fruition within a minute, you know, a matter of 
months, days, weeks. Like, and it's funny, we joke about it. Like, Hey, you know, we threw this out there. It's Wednesday. Just give it a couple of days and something just pops up. And that positive attitude, like anything is possible is, is what I think is his, his biggest strength. Like he's the most positive, like person that I know. And he even keeps me in check when I'm like, no, this can't be this, that, yo, just look at the, look at the good side. What's the bad thing that could happen. And it's like, you know what? You're right. You're right. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. I, I have to agree with you. The, one of the most charming things about you, Eddie, when I first met you, and I was like, this dude's just overwhelmingly positive, man. I can't, <laughs> like, I can't like, I can't say no to this guy. Like I got to Like I, like, I, I'm, he's not, he's like, he's smiling at me. He's in a good mood. He's, he's yeah. okay. If I have to say no, he's okay. If I say yes, like he's so, the same guy. Right. So, so kudos to you, Eddie. Like it's yeah. You, 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 you keep, you keep your personality regardless and you just keep trucking on. Um, Some people say I'm delusional, but it's okay. I'm all right. They say that about me too, man. We'll, we'll, figure it. we'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, right. But you know, it's part of that consistently learning and, and never stopping. Um, do you have any of your own music, either one of you in your own library right now? Um, yeah. All of our music's on the website. Um, no, he's talking about no, I mean, your own, your own creation. Oh no, I'm out of that business. Uh, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Funny, I, I know both of you guys create and produce. Like, is it tempting to put your own music in your own library? So funny, funny with that, right? <laughs> Jason, this goes back to my whole thing. Like, I tell him all the time. I was like, Jason, man, <laughs> I wish you would, you know, uh, you know, I, it, don't, it doesn't make any sense to say I wish you would continue to produce now because, you know, I just wish you would get back into it because he was so good. Like, for example, like, you know, I just went to um, a Rutgers game uh, this past Saturday and you know, I saw some of our old teammates. First thing guy comes up to me, he's like, where's Jason, man? Man, he was the best producer back then, man. He was the best. You know, all his beats were great. And, you know, he was just such, he was like a genius. And I, I was like, man, I tell him all the time, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, so but we don't have any. And, you know, in the flip side to that is when we were roommates, I would see him work so hard at producing. And, you know, he would dig. And like I said, that whole thing about him trying to figure it out, he would do it. So <laughs> in a way that almost like discouraged me from producing because, as a DJ, I know I should be producing, but I would always go back to man. Jason was down there for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> man. I mean, like, like, like if we didn't have practice and other things to do, he would not leave that room. So, like to me, I was like, mm-hmm. man, I don't know if I got enough time in the day to do that, man. Like, you know, so if I wouldn't have seen him do that, I probably would have gotten producing. But since I saw him doing that, I was like, I don't, I don't got enough time to do that. So, I know, spent I years doing that. Reason. I can relate to that, Jason, quite a bit. And I would tell anyone that wants to get into producing now. Figure out your infrastructure before you start producing, because I would produce for my singing group. And that made sense because now my singing group could have music to sing to. But once I was producing without them, I didn't really have a place for the music to go. So imagine now loving every minute of it, by the way, like working 8 a.m., to 6 p.m. on one song, tweaking these little things, getting the right plugins, like things that we're only hearing. Oh my gosh. The late people come in and they're like, I didn't hear any difference. I'm like, well, get out. (laughs) And and uh, but you're but you're tweaking it, you're working hard on it, but you don't have anywhere to put it. Like so you have to figure out your infrastructure first for like how you're going to distribute the music. How are you ultimately going to make this eight, 12, 16 hour day pay off for you? And and that's important too, like because knowing that and knowing what I know now, I would tell my younger self. And also like I tell my younger brother, this, like, like you say infrastructure, but it's also like, know the ways you can monetize your music, right? It's not just with an artist. It's not just getting that placement with, you know, the major, whoever the biggest rapper is at the time, like you can literally go and place that music in a television commercial and, you know, make 10, 20,000, so it's like understanding the business and knowing that there's all these different ways to make money. There's licensing your beat on beat stars. There's putting your music on YouTube and getting, you know, having your tight beats out there and just getting your YouTube views up, right. And getting paid for your YouTube money. There's so many different ways producers can make money and artists can make money um, outside of just what they think is what it means to make it big. Right. And that's what I would tell my my younger self. I could go back and do it again because those sleepless nights, man. And, you know, all the equipment and. Yeah. 
but I, but I, will, I, I, I will say this though, even though we don't necessarily have uh, our own like productions there uh, per se, um, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier as well, like being um, a boutique music house like we are and being very hands on with our artists. Uh, you know, Jason will sit there with some of our younger producers and literally like produce with them and help them oh, cool. to get to where they want to where they want to be. Um, you know, as far as the sync. So that's like, you know, kind of going back to like he's saying, it's not only he's talking about it to his younger self, but he's actually talking to some of our younger producers. And that's the the great part about being with somebody like Audio Vibes is that we're able to, you know, have those hands on and not just throw you in the library and leave you there until somebody picks you up. We're able to actually like help you, um, you know, get through that at that process and, you know, come to us for pointers. Um, that, that happens very often, actually, with some of our producers. Yeah. Yeah, because it is a different format for certain mm. projects and different things. And a lot of these guys don't know that because they just think in the, let me make an eight bar intro or a four bar intro, a 16 right. bar verse, an eight bar hook. And it's like just loops, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that has its time and its place. But like, if you want sync, you need to kind of think a little bit more um, outside of the box, right? Listen to what's already being used. Try to emulate what you're, what you're hearing. Um and there's a formula, right? There's a format to television versus what you would give to, you know, the weekend or something like that, or Drake. Right. Or there's, there's a different type of a um, uh, beat structure. And so teaching them and understanding that, I, you know, we've taken one producer who like was just doing that. And now he's giving us songs with stings at the end, transitions. And it's just like, wow where you were at when you first signed up with us to what the type of music you're making now, it's like night and day with yeah. just a few small minor tweaks. That's great advice. That's great advice. Speaking of, of artists, is there for this audience, is there one artist in your roster that you could recommend to us? No, like which artist in your roster would you say we need to go listen to right now? If they have music, oh, we can listen to them. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to do that. Cause they're all, they're all great. <laughs> You can can take a listen to it. And like, we get excited all the time. Like, it's crazy. Like I don't even, I don't listen to, to a lot of music outside of like, whether I'm scouting or I'm listening to the music in our catalog, because I try to like immerse myself in the song. Like I want to be so ready when a brief comes across our desk that I know exactly where to go. Again, another benefit of having a smaller catalog is that I know the music. Yeah. Right. I know the lyrics. So if I get a brief and they're like, they want something that has this mood or feel, it has this lyrical context. I know exactly where to go. Cause so I'm listening to our catalog all the time. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you to, to go to the website, check out our playlist and listen to some of our artists. Uh, we got some really, really phenomenal talent. Yeah. Not even yeah. I especially saw the roster list. Especially for the, especially for the independent film, um, uh, makers as well you know what i'm saying go there check it out you'll definitely find things that, that fit the mood of your film for sure yeah, that's perfect where, where can we watch by the way house of soul eddie oh yes yes that's on uh youtube um if you just put in house of soul it should come up um but I, i'll provide the link as well so yeah, we'll yeah. put the link in the show notes for that. I, I can't wait to see that. And, you know, yeah. I'm a guy who likes to discover new artists. So uh, I guess I'll have to click on every name on your roster list <laughs> and just like cross reference it with with Spotify or Apple and, and see. see we, we, uh, we have playlists on the, on the we have like all yeah. of uh, uh, filled out playlists already on there. So that should help, too. So, yeah, absolutely. So everybody go to that. Um, gentlemen, you, you've been incredible. I knew this was going to be fun. I knew I was going to smile a lot, learn a lot. <laughs> I think all that is true. Uh, can you tell everybody what the next steps are, like how to get to your website, where they can find you uh, directly, uh, maybe on social media, and maybe even where they can attend your next sync session? Uh, yeah, well, just to be clear, like it's audio vibes, um, and it's all in word. It's uh, spelled audio, then V-Y-B-E-Z. Um, so it's audiovibes.com. It's at audiovibes on Instagram, at audiovibes on Twitter. Um, our next sync session, we're we're planning to do. Um, we want to do another live event. We did we did a live event out in LA. Um, we wanted to do another uh, another live event. So we're we're trying to do that. We're trying to pick the right partner mm-hmm. to come in and, and speak with us. Because again, we're not a we're not an educational platform, but we do want to take the time to educate artists because when they come to us 
we do have expectations that you have, you know, a little bit of knowledge in, in the game to allow us to do our jobs effectively. So we do every now and again, um, try to put together some of these platforms of, of learning, right? So we do like a fan base, um, audio room on occasion. We've done a couple with music supervisors there. Um, we've done some listening sessions where we actually listen to your music, give you feedback. And we've signed a ton of, of artists from that platform as well. Um, we usually post stuff on our Instagram um, for, you know, sync sessions and other, you know, panel stuff that we do. And what's the inst- Instagram handle and, and all the social handles, I suppose? It's all at Audio Vibes, V-Y-B-E-Z. And if someone hates anything you guys said, where can they reach out to each of you directly and, and tell you about uh, it? Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no contact link on our podcast. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> And all the hate mail, all the hate mail to Jason <laughs> at audiovibes.com. Oh, wow. All, all the love mail can go to Eddie at audiovibes.com. Oh, like, oh, man. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's great. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll end on this. Jason, uh, Eddie, you guys were both uh, collegiate football players. Can you uh, tell me now, Jason, I know you also boxed uh, and a good boxer. Uh, <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> no. No, you didn't box? I thought you oh, boxed. No, he did. He did. He did. He's on my, he did. He's on my IG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, was, I thought you boxed. I thought you boxed. Was yeah. the, can you guys, uh, and I'll start with you, Eddie, tell me the hit that uh, that you remember that made you say, you know what? I think I need to go into music. <laughs> oh, I, actually, I actually know exactly what hit that was. <laughs> okay. I do, too. Oh. I do, too. <laughs> um. So I was in practice uh, to make this a very short story. I was in practice one day and I was, you know, I was playing tight end, you know, I was like textbook coming across the middle and somebody hit me. This was actually like one of my, uh, like one of the older guys on the team who I like really looked up to. He's like my guy, even to this, to this, still to this day, he hit me like awkwardly in my, in my stomach, man. And everyone was like, Oh, oh. and everyone was like, Oh yeah. And they're like, Oh, he's down. He ain't getting up. And I was in my head like, man, I'm not getting up, man. I thought it was just the wind knocked out of me. But I actually come to find out, like, I had, like, ruptured in intestines. I had to go to, like, the hospital and get surgery right then and there. And I was on a, afterwards, I was like, I had to stay in the hospital for, like, a few days. I was like, yeah, this, I don't think this is for me. I don't think this is (laughs) for me. Uh, But I still played a year after that, though. And, um, you know, so I I finished out my career. But uh, that definitely had me rethinking some things. (laughs) Friendly fire. What about you, Jason? Um, I would say the same thing, but um, it, it, I have four of those situations, two knees and two shoulders. And then, um, summer training camp, um, you know, we were doing like some power cleans in the weight room and, and snapped my back. Oh my God. Had to go, had to, go to the, the, you know, emergency room, get like an emergency shot into my back at that moment in time. I was like, I just, I can't handle this. It was like going into senior year. I was like, you know, forget pro day and none of that stuff. I just want to be done and I want to be healthy. I would like that one year of being healthy so that was it for me after my back went I was like "Mm, that's it I never played in college but I played football my entire life before that and I remember I was transferring schools and so both my parents worked and that meant I had to ride my bike some days to practice and it wasn't close and it's I live you know in Nashville Tennessee and summers are crazy crazy hot crazy humid so I'm riding my bike to practice I get there by the end of practice, I can't, I can't, I can't see. Like I, I'm kind of like starting to like heat stroke a little bit. Like right. it's like too much. This first, it was the first practice too. I remember this first practice, and I was new to the school, so no one knew my name. They just kept calling me Al B. Shore. <laughs> they just kept calling me Al B. Al B. And because I look like Al B. Shore to them, right? And some people uh, that's going to age me now. Yeah. And uh, I like stumbled over because they had hoses on the fence for water. Yeah. And I like stumbled over to the hose to get water, but I didn't make it. So now I'm laying in all this water that's in the grass. <laughs> and I remember the star running back. His name was Tony Arnold. And he walked over to me, looked down at me. I rolled over to see him. He's like standing up. So he's like looking at God at that point. And I could just basically barely make him out. He said to the rest of the team, I'll be sure and said, fuck it already. <laughs> and I was like, damn. <laughs> They won. Oh, my God. Yo, that's, <laughs> I was that's, like, man, I got to, yeah, maybe, light maybe football guy, is not for me. Light-skinned guys with curly hair, man, it's automatically Albie Shore. I've caught that several times. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Albie, Natalie, 
<laughs> oh my god that's hilarious uh, <laughs> that's the that's the truth of the situation oh, but man. um dude this is great man i can't i can't thank you enough for the stories the insights jason eddie you know uh sincerely that i have nothing and nick as well by proxy we have nothing but high hopes for you guys we know you're going to kill it and, and keep doing your thing i love the personal touch i love the tailored touch I love this idea of getting in the in the bed with artists, not literally, but like, you know, sharing that that camp with them and and mentorship with them and helping them achieve their dreams as well. So I wish you nothing but luck going forward in the future. And uh, this has been a blast. I, I know I'm going to talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. For everything, man. Thank you for having yeah. Anytime. For sure. And for those uh, listening bonsai.film is where you can learn everything about the make it podcast anything you want to learn about us you can also reach out to us at contact at bonsai.film and at social media at underscore bonsai creative on instagram and at twitter just search bonsai creative everywhere else and we'll come right up and please do go to audiovibes.com uh, to get in touch with jason and eddie and remember that's vibes spelled v-y-b-e-z Gentlemen, talk to you soon. Thank you so All much. Right. All right. Be good. Be safe. Peace. Peace. Hey, gang. One more thing before you go. I want to talk to you about Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it's completely free. So join today at www.banzai.film. It just takes a few seconds, and once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter. It's that simple. Go to www.banzai.film to get Indie Insights our bi-weekly newsletter and join a network of film creatives like yourself and don't worry we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need and if you ever tire of indie insights we hope not but if you do simply unsubscribe no gimmicks no games so one more time, go to www.banzai.film to get Indie Insights for free. And thank you for listening.